<laughs> if you like the video make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. For more videos like this. People, what are your true scary, spooky Halloween stories, that gave you chills? When I was about 13, my mom and dad invited round our previous neighbors from the block of flats we lived in until I was 5 years old. Anyway, I'd been sent to bed but could still hear everyone talking about this and that, until the woman neighbor said hey Diggsy's mom, do you remember when Diggsy used to complain that there was someone in his room? Well there's a family that's just moved into the floor above who have a 3 year old son. He is complaining of the exact same things Diggsy did. This creeped me out. I had no recollection of any of this, so the next day asked my mom. Her first reaction was you don't remember? Then she told me all about the weird stuff that used to happen, footsteps up and down the hall, shit going missing and stuff. She said the final thing to happen was when she was listening to a record one day, and it started to slow down, like someone was holding a finger gently on the platter till it finally came to a stop. My mom said she snapped at this point, and started shouting will you leave us the duck alone. As soon as she said this, the record went straight back to playing normally, and we never experienced anything again. I've never experienced anything like that since, and these days I'm quite skeptical of such stories, but I believe my mom. Strangest thing is how I found out about it, from someone else 10 years later experiencing something similar. Okay, this is 100% true even though most people I tell this to in real life don't believe me. When I was really little my parents would let me stay up late on the weekends and watch TV until I fell asleep. I really loved these times and I would stay up later than anybody else just because I could. Well one night I was almost asleep on the couch when I heard a noise on our front porch. It was the sound of our old fashioned porch swing moving back and forth. I was a little scared so I crept toward the bay windows of my living room and peeked out towards the porch. Sitting on my front porch swing was an older woman, probably in her 50s wearing nothing but a nightgown, covered in blood and holding a huge kitchen knife. I flipped out immediately and ran screaming into my parents' room but was too terrified to form words. My parents saw that I was upset, but when I finally was able to tell them what I saw, my dad got really angry and told me that it was just a dream and to go back to bed. I refused and kept crying and screaming until he had had enough and snatched my arm and dragged me towards the front door to prove that nothing was there. I kicked and screamed all the way trying to make him stop, but he kept pulling me. Finally we got to the door, he unlocked it, swung it open and said see Therese nothing th to this day, I have never seen the look of fear and shock that was on his face when that woman turned and stared at both of us and slowly stood up with a knife. My dad slammed the door shut and got my mom to call the police while he went and got his gun. He went back to the door with a 12 gauge and cracked the door enough to stick the barrel out. He asked her what she was doing and she said somebody killed my husband, but it wasn't me. My dad told her that the police were coming, and she freaked out, grabbed the knife and walked away. They police found her 15 minutes later trying to break into one of our neighbor's houses. I never slept in the living room again. My family has lived in rural Nebraska since they immigrated from Germany in the mid-1800s. Near the turn of the century disease was pretty rampant in the homesteading area and it killed off members of almost every family. When someone died from illness, time was of the essence in burying them as not to let the virus spread from the deceased to the living. This meant no wake periods. So an aunt of some unknown number of greats preceding her relationship to me dies of some disease and she gets buried in the family cemetery onto the homestead. The dogs were very fond of her so it wasn't too surprising that after the funeral the two dogs stuck near the grave. The rest of the family began to think something of it when, a week and a half later, the dogs were still visiting her grave almost constantly. But they weren't just at the grave. They were visibly distressed, frantic, and often barking while there. This goes on for maybe two weeks when the family decides to check it out. They dig the casket up and open it. The deceased's hair has all been pulled out. Her fingers are raw and bloody and mangled from where, on the inside of the casket door, they can see deep scratches in the wood. She was comatose when they buried her, and she came to while underground, spending probably her last five or so days alive in a buried casket. This is a true story. Me and my roommate, we'll call him Steven, had a pretty big party for his 30th birthday. There's cake, balloons, weed, and booze. We were having a great time when one of Steven's friends tells him he'll give him $100 to go to the casino and gamble, but he has to go gamble with him. My roommate says hell yay, they get ready to leave, so does everyone else, and the party ends. So eventually everyone leaves and it's just me. I clean up a bit, turn all the lights off in the apartment except my bedroom light, get into my nightwear and sit on my bed to watch some TV. As I'm sitting there, I keep hearing this dragging noise, followed 15 seconds later by a light plop. 
This goes on for 25 to 30 minutes, but I don't see anything out of the ordinary so I figure maybe it's something going wrong with the fish tank. I keep hearing this for 15 more minutes, thinking nothing of it, when some movement by my bedroom door catches my attention. One of the balloons we used for the party, a big number zero, is sitting at the threshold of my door. Seemingly appearing out of nowhere. I just stare at it like WTF, then as if on cue, it moves inside my room, dragging the plastic bottom on the ground about half a foot, floats up about a half a foot, floats forward about a foot very slowly, and plops the weight back down on the ground. Then it just sits there, doing nothing, and a few minutes later it would repeat it. All this time I'm sitting there horrified. The balloon continues to move toward me and my bed until it plops down right at the edge of my bed and kind of leans in, right in my face. I jumped up and backed way the duck up, searching for a logical explanation for what I just observed. When I was about 6 or 7 years old my family decided to go on summer vacation up to a little island in Maine. We rented out this old house on the water. From what I can remember, there were about 6 or 7 other houses on the island. Everyone else who lived there was in their 60 plus years of age, except for this mid-40s gentleman who fished on the water, his name was Bubba, I shit you not. Anyway, the island was exceedingly creepy. Everything about the house was really old. Every piece of furniture from that house was probably over 60s years old, not to mention there was no television, running water was used through a well and pump, hundreds of books and pictures in the house dated through AT at least the last 100 years. To make things more pants shittingly creepy, was there was an infestation of rats in the backyard that would run around at night. Also, whenever we made dinner all of the old ladies who lived in the houses on the island somehow knew, and would show up and give us blueberry pie and fresh caught bluefish. It was really creepy. It was as if everyone knew what we were doing and when we did it. Long story short, a few nights into our stay at this house my parents started hearing singing at night. They said that it would start and stop for about 20 to 30 minutes. The first few nights they didn't think much of it. The following day, they asked around but they couldn't find the source of the singing. The second to last night on our week-long stay my whole family heard the singing, and we went outside to find out what was going on. It sounded like a choir of children. It really freaked all of us out, but we didn't want it to ruin the trip, it was just very mysterious. The next day my dad starts checking out some of the old photos and books in the library and finds this old scrapbook dated to the early 1920s. The house we were living in was once an old schoolhouse, and there was a picture of the boys' choir. We all shat bracks. Left the next day. I went coon hunting with my uncle in the woods of southern Ohio. These lights and noise came out of nowhere and seemed to pin us down. The red bones, coon hounds, went silent and cried on the ground, they are not of afraid of bears or anything I have seen, as a heavy fog rolled onto us and we were almost frozen. Two seconds later it was all gone, the fog and everything. The dogs were still freaked out so we knew it was just not us. I was 12 so I was not drunk or on drugs. Creeps me out to this day. Nice to see you Digsy. When I was a kid I had an imaginary friend named Jesse. I don't really remember much about him but my I remember my parents asking about him quite a lot and seeming quite concerned. Anyway, a couple of years ago while visiting relatives in Ireland we were all exchanging ghost stories, my family has a lot of creepy shit happening to them, when my mum brought up Jesse so I was obviously quite confused because I thought he was just an imaginary friend. Well my mum started off by saying how she didn't understand why I called him Jesse as I'd never heard that name before and she didn't know anyone who was called that, which I didn't think was too weird, it's just a name right. Then she said that one time when my dad was on his way to work, he was an electrician in a mine at the time, I asked him to bring back coal for Jesse's gran. I was about two thirds at the time and wouldn't have understood what a mine was if I even knew he worked in one. Then the end of her story was when we were on a day trip to a place we visited a lot when I was really young and I suddenly just ran off and they followed me into a graveyard. I ran straight to a small grave and stopped and just stared at it. It was Jesse's grave. I felt quite creeped out that I spent a lot of time as a child playing with a ghost. I'm a kid who likes his sleep very much so my dad often had to wake me up as I slept through my alarm. He wakes me up the same way every time, by gently putting a hand on my shoulder and then since I usually plead for 5 more minutes, he yanks the covers off and forces me up. So a few weeks ago I had to get up very early to go play pick up basketball in the morning with some friends. I set my alarm the night before and went to sleep. My dad works very far away so he often sleeps at work 2 or 3 nights a week and that night he wasn't sleeping at home so I knew I had to get myself up. I eventually fall asleep and I then wake up to a hand on my shoulder, murmur the usual 5 more minutes, and then I feel the covers yanked off me all the way off the bed. I shot up out of bed because it was habit at this point because this is when I knew my dad was serious. I opened my eyes and it was pitch black in my room and nobody was there. 
I looked around and saw nothing. Just the lights on my clock that said it was 2.30 in the morning. I was a little more than slightly freaked out. I asked my mom in the morning if my dad had came home but she said no, he had stayed at work. I've never shared this story on the internet before, this is my genuine terrifying childhood experience. I have my share of believable creepy stuff that's happened to me, but this is paranormal-ish and I'm always somewhat uneasy about sharing it because, as a skeptic, I'd normally call this kind of story bullshit. Just like my parents and friends would tell me. I was always the kid that made up stories, but this one is real. I shared a room with my sister around the age of 7, but she was off at a sleepover party the night it happened. As a little kid, I was terrified of lots of things, I'd never seen anything close to a horror film, not even the nightmare before Christmas, because of how jumpy I was. So naturally the dark freaked me out. I was really nightmare prone, which caused everyone to say this was a dream later. But this was different. It was more vivid. Too realistic to be a dream. I was hiding under my sheets like the cowardly kid I was when I decided to poke my head out to get some cool air, and I saw something in my room. Something clearly not human. I called it an alien at the time because that's the closest thing my horror ignorant mind could liken it to. Now, I see it as more similar to the rake or the mothman. Its head was big and egg-shaped, like those stereotypical grey aliens. Far too big for its tiny, slender body. It was totally naked. Pale grey or ashen white skin, the lack of light made it hard to tell. All the bones were visible. Its tiny shriveled sack and penis just hung there between its legs. Its hands were way too big for the toothpick like arms. It was standing at a really unnatural angle. Its eyes were totally black and shiny, seemed to be the only feature on its weird head, and were sunken in little red holes. Most unsettling of all, it was just staring at me. After a few seconds of being completely paralyzed in fear, I pulled the covers back up over my head, what else could I do? I stayed there for the rest of the night, until I fell asleep. I know this thing wasn't human. I told my parents the next day and they said I was dreaming. I made up a lot of stories back then. I remember a lot of them vividly, and the rest of my childhood is really, really hazy. But seeing that thing in my room is one of the childhood memories that stuck with me the most. I have no idea what it was, and despite my fascination with horror stories, I don't think I want to know. This is totally true, maybe not very spectacular but a creepy thought nonetheless. When I was in high school the drama department set up a haunted house for Halloween. It was generally pretty mediocre. For a play they had recently done, they had a cable hanging from the stage ceiling to which you could wear a harness and hang there. To the cable was attached a fake noose for a scene in which somebody was hung in the play, only fake in that it didn't cinch up when you put weight on it, but it also didn't have any give. Basically, as long as the harness held you up the noose fell loose around your neck. Really a stupid idea in retrospect. Naturally, this was implemented into the haunted house and I volunteered to play a hanging trick or treater. I wore a dinosaur outfit and a mask and held a bag of candy and pretended to be dead and hang there. At one point, I took a break as the harness was riding up in no-no places and while I was gone, some retards took the liberty of grabbing the noose and swinging around the stage from it. This somehow tightened the noose without my knowing and when I returned, I put the mask on, stepped up on a ladder, connected my harness, put the noose around my neck and let myself hang. The noose tightened around my neck cutting off the circulation and air and immediately I began to black out, I felt myself falling asleep comfortably and only after a few seconds did it occur to me what was happening. I suddenly remembered that I was hanging there and blindly reached out for the ladder. I pulled myself onto it and relieved the pressure on my throat. My nerves were going nuts and I was shaking and my head hurt so I stood there for a moment, took off the noose and harness and walked away. I'm certain I could have easily hung myself accidentally then and there, and it's clear what would have resulted. Every year, new students would recount the legend of the one drama student that hung there for hours in the school's haunted house while families paraded past him unaware that the dead trick or treater they were ogling was actually dead. He was only to be discovered by his poor girlfriend at the end of the night. Despite consistent denial by faculty, the legend would persist. When I was a kid I used to go and visit my uncle's lodge in the school holidays. It was on this huge property and backed onto the edge of bushland, so my brother and I always had a whole bunch of stuff to do to keep us occupied. I remember I was with my dog one day playing near an empty creek when he suddenly just took off into the trees. Everyone else had gone into town and my dad was asleep inside so I was pretty much alone and decided to go after him. He was much quicker than I was and I got lost pretty quickly. I was starting to get a bit upset because I couldn't find my dog and I had no idea where I was so I turned around from where I thought I came from and tried to run back and get my dad so he could help me find him. From what I remember I tripped over a tree root or something and fell down this embankment. 
I must have hit my head on something because I woke up in the bottom of this small gully not knowing how I got there, everything was still a bit fuzzy. What actually woke me up was my dog licking my face. He was lying down right next to me. How he found me I don't know, but I was really happy to see him. But then he started barking but it was a bark I hadn't really heard him do before and he was still lying flat on his stomach, that's the strange thing I remember about that part. A really strange lying down, grumble sort of bark. It made me scared a little bit. I turned to see what he was looking at and there was a guy standing there. I remember he had this really faded cowboy hat thing on that had a big chunk missing on the side. Hey kid, you had a pretty bad fall, but you should be alright. Let me get you back to your home he said in this really, really deep voice. Then he walked over to me, picked me up, grabbed my hand and we started walking back through the bush. The two things I remember from that walk were holding his gloves which I though was weird because it was the middle of summer and really hot at the time. The other one was my dog was walking to close to me, I was pretty much tripping the whole way back because he kept smacking into the side of my leg on the way back. The guy didn't say anything though, in fact I don't actually remember him saying anything at all apart from the first time he spoke. I don't think we walked for that long because we reached the creek bed really quickly and I could hear my name being called out by dad for dinner. I started to run up to the house and remembered I forget to thank the guy for getting me here so I turned to yell, thanks mister but he was already gone. I just figured he was in a hurry or something. A few days later I was in the supermarket with my mom, it was one of those small country town ones that kind of sell everything and everyone knows everyone else there. So I'm kind of just wandering around and there's this photo up on the wall of this guy in a cowboy hat with a big chunk in the side missing, it was the guy who helped me in the woods. I wanted to thank him or something for helping me before so I asked the person working there who he is. Turns out he was the original owner of the store around 30 years ago but died in a freak accident in the woods, where my dog and I were apparently back in the day he used to grow vegetables for the store himself in the middle of these woods, I don't know why, I guess the soil was more fertile or something. He went one day to see how they were growing when a really bad storm started up. Apparently he was trying to get back but his dog, who always went with him, fell down a really steep embankment into a small gully so this guy went after it. While he was down there a branch broke off a tree and hit him, breaking his back. They didn't find him till weeks later. His dog was also found with him, by his side. It died of starvation. That's how I found out about Mr. Rogerson anyway. Anyways, I grew up in a small town in Kansas that I have since gotten the duck out of. The town had tons of meth addicted trailer trash. One time a good friend of mine spotted some creepy abandoned house on some off road several miles outside of town. We were ducking stupid and decided to check it out. You could tell it was abandoned because the windows were all busted out and all that. The front door was jammed shut, but we managed to get in by shoving ourselves into it hard enough. The house smelled like chemicals. I'm not sure how else to describe it, but the air kind of stung your nose very slightly when you breathed in. One thing I saw, but never gave a second thought to until later was a metal can full of rocks with a string cutting across about a foot above foot level in a doorway. We just stepped over it. We eventually made our way upstairs. There was broken glass all up the stairs, and it cracked loudly as we walked up. Yes, I know at this point you are going to think we were dumb as hell for not getting the duck out of there, and you are absolutely correct, but we were some dumb 16 year olds who were a bit too curious. Anyways at the top of the stairs we saw some scary as hell junkie. He was holding a handgun. He was freaking out, and screaming shit at us. We ran the duck out of there. Turns out we stumbled into a meth lab. I drove past the place a couple years ago and the house has been torn down. Scariest thing that's happened to me though. I grew up in a haunted house. So, I have many of these stories. This house was 3 stories and 5,000 square feet it was moderately new. Built in the 60s, located in the middle of the woods. Creepy enough, without the haunted part. One time we were all watching TV downstairs in the basement, basically just the ground level floor at the bottom of the house, the kitchen is right above the TV room. It's nearly 10 PM, all of a sudden we hear what sounds like a man with work boots on, stomping through the kitchen. We pause the movie and all look at each other, like, oh no, not this again. My grandpa tells us to stay downstairs. He goes upstairs and returns about 5 minutes later. All the doors are locked. All the lights are off. There is no one in the house. We all just stare at each other completely freaked out. And resume watching the movie. When I was little I used to see black figures walking around the upstairs section of the house. We had this balcony, thing, that overlooked the library slash conversation room. That balcony connected to my grandparents room their room connected to a bathroom the bathroom connected to the sewing room sewing room connected to the staircase landing, that connected to the other side of the balcony. So, it was all a big loop. That floor, in itself, 
was haunted as all hell. When me and my sister used the bathroom, we went together, in case something bad happened. One time we were in my grandparents' bathroom and she was peeing. I was standing next to the sink and saw something move out of the corner of my eye, in my grandparents' bedroom doorway. I looked and saw a huge black figure walking around the room. I started screaming black thing. Black thing. And my sister and me jumped up and ran through the sewing room, towards the stairs. As we were running, we heard the black thing running through the bedroom and across the balcony. We could hear it running behind us as we went down the stairs, then it stopped once we reached the kitchen. Crazy. When I was younger we frequently visited my grandparents around holidays even though we didn't live in the same town. My aunt lived two houses down from my grandparents. The lady in the house between was creepy. She was a large woman, over six feet. She wore logging chains around her neck, a dress and work boots. The only time I remember seeing her outside was either in her garden in the back or when she was washing the outside of her house. Scrubbing the actual building. She did this often. During these times she would yell at us kids and call us all kinds of things. She would tell us the devil would be coming for us. The adults told us to leave her alone and to avoid her. We would run the distance between my aunts and my grandparents because when you passed by she was watching out the windows. It was creepy and we never went alone. One Halloween one of the cousins dared us to trick or treat her house. I remember how scared I was, but I didn't want to be a chicken. Plus I was going with the group. One of us rang the doorbell and there was a lot of banging noises in the house suddenly like door slamming. When she answered the door she had a severed head in her hands and we all went screaming. The adults told us it was a Halloween prop and we knew we shouldn't be bothering her and deserved to be scared. About a month later my parents got a phone call that the lady had tried to kill my aunt while she was bringing in groceries and had my young cousin in her arms. The lady had one of them rope saws and had come up behind my aunt with it. She put it over her head and around her neck and proceeded to saw. My aunt naturally flipped and started kicking the door. My uncle came and beat the lady down with a fire poker. The police investigation revealed that the woman had been digging tunnels under her home which were coming up under my aunt's, my grandparents and another neighbor's house. She had been bringing the dirt up and putting it in the raised beds of the gardens. She also had a shrine of some sort underground which had a few severed heads around it. My aunt survived BTW but has a long scar across her neck. When my mom was about three years old, my grandma and grandpa moved into an apartment on the ninth floor in downtown Columbus. After they moved in she didn't have many friends so she developed an imaginary friend named Kathy. Over the course of a year her relationship with Kathy was getting out of hand. She didn't want to play with anything or anyone else. My grandma and grandpa took her to counseling and to see psychologists but they just said it was a normal childhood behavior. She started blaming Kathy for things that got broke and messes that were made and my grandpa had had enough. My grandpa went out to get a dog to occupy her time with instead of her imaginary friend. So he goes out and gets a German Shepherd pup from the pound and brings it home. When he gets back my mother is playing in the corner by a window with Kathy. As soon as he walks in the dog stares straight at my mom and starts barking and snarling. All of the hair on his back is raised and he is ready to attack and my mom starts screaming and all of a sudden the dog stops and my mom just starts crying. My grandparents are freaked out at this point and ask my mom what happened and she says that Kathy fell out of the window. After that she never played with or mentioned Kathy again. Cut to a few months later. They are moving out of the apartment because my grandma, super religious, can't handle what happened. My grandpa talks to the landlord and somehow the story comes up about Kathy. The landlord is shocked and tells him that the tenants before them moved out after their five-year-old daughter Kathy fell out of the window and died. I'm sure many won't believe this story but it's 100% true. Even my super religious grandma swears by it to this very day. This sounds really crazy. I don't care if you don't believe me, but here are the facts. For years, I'd go through periods where when I was trying to fall asleep I'd see a bunch of faces when I closed my eyes. They were all angry faces, very angry and menacing. They'd come towards me then kind of fade off to the sides, two rows, one on each side. Sometimes it was just angry eyes. Human, animal, cartoon, all very angry. It took a long time to realize that when I saw these faces, it meant I was about to dream about a place I actually really liked. The place only existed in my dreams but it was like an alternate universe for me. I had memories of that place like anyone does about their childhood, but it didn't exist. I don't want to expand on the dream place because I'm trying to get back there again and I don't want to ruin my chances. I told a few people once about this place, specific things I remember. Then a few nights later the angry faces were back and I was all excited about going to my favorite place again. When I got there, various people who lived there, people I knew and liked, suddenly had angry faces, like the ones that usually come before I go to this place. They shot me. 
Three times. In three different rooms. Twice I woke up after getting shot. I didn't wake up in real life, but the me in my dream woke up. I thought, wow, I'm glad I made it through that, looked over, saw another old friend with a now angry face, and get shot again. I didn't wake up the third time. This shooting happened about seven to eight years ago. I've really missed the place. I keep trying to force myself to remember the angry faces, thinking if I can fall asleep visualizing them they might show up. No such luck, but about two years ago I was dreaming I was in some kind of street market, either an old-timey one or one located in a country that wasn't at all modern. A woman was leaning over a well in the middle of the town square, she was wearing a large brimmed, purple hat. She looked right at me. Angry face, like the old days. I was both freaked out and kind of relieved. Like somehow I wasn't forgotten by that place and those people I used to visit. That was two years ago. I now work in a hotel in the heart of downtown Chicago. I see a lot of people on the street. I sold my car last winter and take public transportation, so I see more people now than I used to when I just drive by in my car. I'm in crowds fairly often. And six months ago, I saw that woman. I wasn't dreaming. I checked. That woman from the well was there, and she had her angry face on. In the last six months or so, I've seen 10 to 12 more people who were glaring at me, the way those faces used to. Then the people disappear in the crowd when I try to follow them. I'm kind of scared but I'm also kind of thrilled. I know I sound crazy, but these people might be following me around in real life now. I still can't get back to that place I used to go to, though. I've always been a night owl. I have never been able to fall asleep easily, so I have a tendency to read, surf around, or occasionally just pace the house. I also grew up on a farm, so on nights when the moon was light enough, I would go walk in the pasture if I was feeling especially restless. This was definitely one of those nights. I pulled on a pair of jeans and some shoes figuring a walk would help me relax. Stepping out onto the porch, some movement near the barn caught my eye. In the light, I could make out the figure of a man carrying something. The sound of the door opening most have alerted him because he started coming towards me. The distance from our porch to the stock barn is about 25 yards, so it wasn't a terribly large distance and even in the dim light I was able to realize the man had a gun. My heart racing, I backed into the house and deadbolted the door. Living in a small town in rural East Texas, the door had been unlocked before. Terrified, I stumbled into my parents' room and woke my father. I told him I'd seen a man with a gun in our backyard, and he quickly grabbed his shotgun and told my mom to call the cops. Since we lived far out, it would be 20 or so minutes before we would see any police so dad and I went out to check on the animals. When we stepped outside it was dead quiet. There was no sign of anyone in our yard, so we walked briskly towards the barn where I'd seen the man. We had, at the time, a few cattle, goats, a bad-tempered donkey, about a half dozen chickens, and my mangy old cat, Velcro. None of them were to be seen, the barn was completely empty the slept close by, and the goats weren't penned at night, but they always slept inside the barn. Something had spooked them out of their sleep, but there was no sign of anyone. We did a quick sweep of the area and found that someone had tried to force the door to the attached tool shed open and failed, but otherwise nothing was really missing. After searching for a while and finding nothing, we gave up and hung out in the barn waiting for the cops. The electricity ran into the barn near a small enclosed chicken coop, and my dad kept a small fridge out there with a padlock on it. He opened it up and produced two beers while we waited. The cops came and we searched again, finding footprints in the cracked doorframe of the shed where the guy had tried to enter, but no real damage. After the cops left, we finished our beers leaning against the coop and eventually went to bed thinking that we'd spook the guy and he'd left. We had spooked the guy, but apparently wasn't able to find a way off of the property. In the morning when we went out to the collect the eggs we had a pretty horrible surprise. Of all the places we'd looked, we never thought to check inside the chicken coop, which was a pretty large area. Apparently, whoever this guy was had decided to hide out in there when we came outside. Every one of our chickens had been killed, we assumed to keep them quiet. While we were leaning against the coop relaxing and drinking our beers, this guy had been inside of it killing our chickens the entire time. This is completely true. So, my mom remarried about two years ago. My dad died when I was 12 so she had been widowed for over 10 years. This new relationship was very whirlwind with them meeting, dating, and getting married within three months. I didn't know much about the guy, but my mom was happy, so I just tried to be supportive. She moved into his house in upstate Virginia and invited my fiancé and I to spend a weekend in her new home getting to know her new husband. My mom's new home was pretty isolated. It sat on a few hundred acres of lovely rolling hills, and was very picturesque. I was nervous about getting to know this guy, but really trying to make the most of it. Over the course of our first day there though, 
I felt more and more uneasy. I didn't think it was weird, just silly. My mom's new husband was being very welcoming and friendly. We were being made to feel very at home, yet I still couldn't shake this oppressive feeling. I finally chalked it up to me being more upset about my mom getting remarried than I was willing to admit to myself. We spent most of the day wandering around outside since I felt worse when indoors. That night my fiancé and I showered together. When I turned my back to him he stopped talking mid-sentence and asked, What did you do to your back? Well, nothing. Why? You have a large bruise. I hopped out to try and see it in the mirror. I got back in and we finished showering in silence. Then it was off to bed. The one window in our room looked out over a pitch black empty field, but I couldn't sleep until I hung something over the window. I felt sure that otherwise someone would watch us through the window. The next morning I had a complete meltdown. I woke up and just couldn't stop crying. I told my finance we had to leave. He tried to calm me down by telling me all the things I had been telling myself. My feelings of anxiety were just a result of seeing my mom with someone. The longer I spent with them the easier it would become. But I just had to leave. It was only Saturday morning and we were supposed to stay until Monday, but I felt completely hysterical. I knew I was on the verge of a panic attack and my only concrete thought was I had to stop crying long enough to make our excuses and get the hell out. We did. As soon as we were on the road I felt like a weight had been lifted. I was even feeling embarrassed for my behavior, hoping I hadn't insulted my mom's husband by leaving early. Then my fiancé broke the silence, that bruise on your back, did you get a good look at it? I had. It looked like some had touched the middle of back, with fingers spread wide, with their hand at a tilt. I want to make completely clear, no one had touched my back the previous day, especially hard enough to bruise me. Cut to three weeks later. My mom comes to visit me. The entire time she's hounding me to come stay with her again. After finally trying to change the subject for the fifth time, I level with her. Before I've even finished telling the story her face is white as a sheet. She tells me she has been feeling the same way in the house. She hates it. She wants them to move as soon as possible. And the real kicker, her new husband's previous wife shot and killed herself right outside in the same field our room window overlooked. When I was young I had a dream. In the dream I was standing in a giant field of dying knee-high grass, and the field was encircled by a huge range of mountains. It was brilliantly sunny out. There was a path that cut straight through the field. I stood in the middle of the field on the path, in the center of the circle. The path cut straight through both sides of the circling mountains creating a giant gorge at either end of the circle, I'm trying to describe this as well as possible. Apologies. As I'm standing in the middle of the circle, out of nowhere my grandfather appears walking towards me. He stops and we have a discussion. It's very nondescript and pretty short but ends with him telling me that he's proud of me and that he needs to get going. We say goodbye, and he walks away from me along the path towards the other end. I wake up to the phone ringing. My mom answers it. It's the hospital notifying my parents my grandfather had passed away. When I was a freshman in college I was on a film shoot near Barstow on Route 66. We were shooting on the property of the cafe known for the film Baghdad Cafe. This property has an abandoned motel attached to it, which is where we were shooting this unbelievably bad horror film. The motel's floor was full of papers, something I initially figured was a relic from the past, while the motel was actually doing business. A while into the shoot, we started picking up the papers and reading them. They were handwritten letters from the 70s, perhaps never sent. They were addressed to dozens of different people, starting out normal, but going on to describe some really, really ducked up things. This was a guy who literally had some demons. He kept talking about how they were watching him and the like. The handwriting also got more and more messed up as we assembled the letters chronologically. Meanwhile, outside the motel there was a storage container with keep out spray painted on it. Naturally, we were curious. There was a hole in the side, and someone reached in and pulled out some documents. Among them was a letter, on government typeface, I think it was the VA, telling the person who wrote those crazy letters that he was, unknowingly, a participant of some tests of hallucinogenic substances while he was in the army. This whole time, there was a room in the abandoned motel that was sealed off, that we were strictly forbidden from entering. All the windows were covered by plywood, and the door was barricaded shut. It smelled like death. Seriously the worst smell I've ever encountered in my life. The house I lived in before this one was beyond haunted, though we never physically saw anything. When we first moved in we were redoing the floor in the kitchen and the master bedroom. My husband at the time would leave for work and I'd be left alone in this house with no furniture, no floors, and nothing to do. I can't explain it, but alone in that bedroom at night I felt the most mind-numbing fear you could ever think of. I could not stay in that room. 
I bolted out of the house at 4 a.m. after he'd left and slept in my car with my dog until daylight. And that was just the first experience. A week or so later, the house was finished, we moved all the furniture in and I began sleeping in my real bedroom across the house. A friend and her husband moved in with us, and the boys went away for training for two weeks, they were US Marines, leaving us girls to fend for ourselves. The first night she comes running into my bedroom asking to sleep with me because her bed was shaking. I laughed it off thinking she was probably just sleepwalking and made room. No more than five minutes later, my bed starts shaking like an earthquake. We stayed completely frozen and waited for it to stop. The next night, same thing. Night after night our beds would shake and we would be terrified. Her bedroom was the one I had slept in when we first moved in. The room I felt the mind-numbing fear. She refused to sleep in there alone. She said she'd hear something like fingernails in the closet scratching from the ceiling all the way to the floor. Another night she went to sleep with her closet door closed and her fan off. She woke up an hour later to her door open and the fan on. Another night she was in my bathroom and I was in my bedroom when both lights cut. We figured okay, old house, power outage. We made our way down the hallway and started flipping switches. Every other light in the house worked except the two rooms we were in. I called my father, an electrician, asking for help. Everything was working perfectly, yet still, no lights. After 20 minutes of arguing with my father that we were not going back into that room, we finally walked back into my room when both lights magically came back on. We set up a video camera one night around Halloween of last year hoping to capture something. We positioned it on my kitchen table pointing down the hallway to my bedroom. The first video had shadows crossing the walls, when no one was around, and the picture would randomly distort and become fuzzy, then become clear again. We fully charged the camera, and set it up to run for the next 4 hours. In the video you can see my ex-husband and I walk down the hall, go into our bedroom, and when we turned off the light the video stops. The battery was dead after 6 minutes of video and a full charge. Months later, we were having a bonfire with a bunch of my ex-husband's friends. The boys all came in the house to grab some food and beer. Clark was the first out the door and came screaming back into the house. Everyone just kind of stared at him like he was crazy and asked what happened. He swore up and down he'd seen three men in Civil War uniforms standing around the fire. Clark certainly wasn't drunk, but he was scared out of his mind. Activity slowed down after that, and just little things here and there would happen. Whatever it was got used to us and turned from scaring us to playing jokes on the new people who came over to spend the night. Their things would go missing, the couch or bed they were sleeping on would shake, but my bed never did again. It almost became a joke around the house. We never did see anything though. I've had a few strange and creepy experiences growing up. The creepiest by far though was when I was in high school. It was summer and my mother had left her laptop home for me to use to pass the time during the day since she had left me no chores that day. Our house an old two-story building that was built in the late 1800s, early 1900s. It has hardwood floors throughout the first floor and carpeted on the second. Because of the age of the building, and the fact that the second story was a later addition, no matter where you are upstairs you can hear, and often feel, when someone is walking around downstairs. If you have ever lived in an old house with hardwood floors, you understand what I'm talking about. So one evening I was laying out on the floor in my room whilst I used the computer. AIM was a must given the fact that it was the turn of the millennium and MSN hadn't figured out that whole Mac slash Microsoft bridge yet. I remember hearing my stepdad drive into the driveway at the back of the house. Hopping to my feet, I looked through the navy blue curtains and could see the red hue of his burgundy Chevy Denali in the driveway. I immediately laid back down and told my friend that I had to log off, stepfather was home and was going to be pissed that I was using my mother's computer, even if it was with permission. Around this point I heard him set the alarm on his car, walk up the porch stairs, fumble with his keys, and lumber into the den where he heavily dropped his stuff. I cursed under my breath and hastily logged off. Gathering up the computer, I slinked my way to the stairwell ready to take my licks. However, when I got to the stairwell I noticed all the lights were off downstairs still. I thought, that's fine, sometimes he doesn't turn on lights. It's his house, he knows where stuff is. So I force a nervous chuckle and head down the rest of the stairs, into the darkness of the first floor. Sorry about using her laptop. She said I could. Silence greeted my words. Odd, I thought, usually he chides me or otherwise takes me down a notch. Thinking he is in the bathroom, I set the laptop on the couch in the den and began to leave. It was then, as my eyes finished adjusting to the light, that I noticed it. His things were not where I had thought they would be. My heart skips a beat and my eyes fly to the window that looks into our backyard and driveway. The light is on, but there is no Denali. Fearing a burglar, 
I rushed to the back door only to find it locked securely. Too afraid to do anything else, I grabbed the cordless phone and hightailed it to my room, locking myself in. This is where the experience was taken to a new level. Sitting in my room, panting and shaking as I held the phone, I could both hear and feel as multiple people were walking around on the hardwood floor. Some people even felt like they were stomping. Realizing that I may not be alone, I thought of the only thing a crazed teenage girl could think of, I called my friends across the street. The first friend was a talking WH re. I figured she would never answer, I was used to her busy signal, but I had to try. Punching in the number quickly, I brought the phone to my ear and waited, dial tone, three ring, voicemail. Shit. Duck. Dialed up the second friend. I felt I had a chance, she was never on the phone, busy signal. Sure the third friend, the one I was talking to online would answer, busy signal, dial up FML. So I'm sitting there, listening to the footsteps and the dial tone as I'm trying to figure out if I should try the first friend again. Static crackled through the dial tone and broke my thoughts as I stared at it. Almost immediately the static shift from a crackle to laughter and I straight up opened my door and chucked the phone down the hall. The footsteps got louder and I tried to think out a resolution to the problem. I needed the third friend off the internet. I needed someone to validate that I wasn't going crazy and hearing things. But the only way to get her offline would be to go get the computer from the first floor. Swallowing hard, I threw open the bedroom door and made a made dash for the computer. I grabbed the computer and rushed back upstairs. While I was down there, I could hear the footsteps in other rooms other than the ones I was in. Rushing back into my room, I hopped back online and forced my friend to get off the internet so I could call her. Retrieving the phone from the hallway I relocked myself in and dialed her up. When she answered I recounted what had happened and asked her if she could hear it. For listening purposes, I made my way towards the stairwell, aka ducking wooden echo chamber. Eventually it stopped and then seemed to start back up again only lights were turning on. Inching down I realized it was my mother and told the friend I would talk to her later. After a little talk with my mother I found out that she had been home for about 5 minutes. This had all started at about 7 pm. Even if my mother had been way off, and arrived 15 minutes before, that would still leave me with 15 minutes of unexplained phenomena.